is ludicrous. Jimmy Neutron, you got a comment? Jimmy Neutron. 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 Jimmy. 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 James Isaac Neutron. Hi there. Uh, so last time I said I wanted this to be all one big long video and uh, eventually it became more practical to break it up into four smaller videos and ultimately I think that will make for a more effective product. The only problem is now I have to write an introduction for just season two. And I was honestly thinking about how weird it was to break these up by season because as a kid, I didn't know where the season break happened. I, I didn't know the difference between season one and season two. But uh, then I realized that's not true. There is one big indication of what's season one and what's season two. The way Libby's hair looks. And look, I don't want to relitigate the Libby's hair debacle, but it is a passable segue into the first episode, Beach Party Mummy. The season opens with Jimmy going full mad scientist and resurrecting the dead. They make fun of Ken Burns, by name, not even a parody of him, and we learn Libby's family hails from Egypt. I'm sure that won't come back. Jimmy decides they're gonna sneak out, once again just blatantly breaking the rules. He doesn't even invite Nick to come with them this time. Sheen gives my favorite Sheen joke. It'll go on our permanent record! Carl, how many times do I have to tell you, your permanent record is just a myth? Like the Loch Ness Monster, or North Dakota! And they're off to Egypt. Jimmy tries to uncover the lost tomb of an Egyptian queen, which is actually the plot of the 1932 The Mummy. And it's 1959 Remake. They also get to play with another, as of yet unexplored 50s thing, beach party movies. Egyptian beach party! Beach party. Shake it loose on the night! did kind of start to bleed over into monster movies, or, or monster movies bled into it. I don't believe it. It can't be what it is. It! See, on top of me absolutely noticing her hair changing in the previous episode, this would have been a better reveal if I hadn't seen her look like that already. Naturally, they light Jimmy's revivify machine and bring some mummies back, and they don't seem too cool about it. I can bring the dead back to life! All right! You trampled all over the laws of nature! Way to go! So Libby gets her new look to fool the mummies. And unlike Cindy's redesign from the movie, I don't think either of these are the better look. I like both of them fine. And like I said last episode, I thought it was weird they even bothered to explain her change in appearance. I just accepted it the first time I saw it. This is also an important episode for the romance stories. It's the first time we really get any hint of a Sheen Libby romance, and boy do they lean hard on the Jimmy and Cindy thing. Honestly, given some of the things that happen later, maybe a little too hard? But Jesus, look how jealous she is instantly gets when she thinks Jimmy is flirting with Libby. Libby, quick, I need you! Why, Jimmy, this is so sudden. Hey, what's going on? This, this is beautiful. I also appreciate the touch of animosity between Cindy and Libby. It shows they've been friends long enough to know which buttons to push. Overall, a strong start to season two. You know, I've been stopping to talk about these characters and how much I love all of them, and I know we're only on the first episode, but I can't think of a better place to stop and talk about one Miss Libby Fullfax. Now, I don't think a lot of black girls were watching Jimmy Neutron back in the day. Some certainly were. I know a few who were, but they definitely seemed like a pretty small portion of the show's actual demographic. Which is too bad, because I think Libby's the type of character a lot of shows were missing in our childhood. Libby is essential to Jimmy Neutron, exactly as she is. The show doesn't work without her. It doesn't work without any of these characters. She's a unique voice in the story that keeps it grounded. I talk a lot about the 50s influence on the show, but Libby helps keep it modern. And not just because she's black, but like kinda because she's black. The 50s were racist, let's not pretend they weren't. But my point was, Libby's hip and trendy and into popular music. 
And make no mistakes, Jimmy Neutron is a very 2000s TV show. The low quality CG, the modern pop culture references, the music, the costumes. As much as it apes the 50s, it makes certain you know when it was made, for better or for worse. But in Libby's case, that's certainly for the better. She's integral to the plot and gets plenty of funny moments. She's a really humorous character. And honestly, she never felt like pandering because... Well, like I said, it never seemed like this show was trying to appeal to black girls. She was just a good character who happened to be a black female. I never felt like I was being preached to. You know, like I do. Now. Listening to myself. My one issue is that she's definitely the character most likely to get sidelined and arguably rightfully so. As much as she works off the other characters, she doesn't have much of a relationship with Jimmy. She'll dunk on him, but mostly to back up Cindy or just to shut down his ego. They seem like the type of people who mostly hang out because their friends hang out with each other. I don't think that's the worst, it just means she doesn't show up in episodes where maybe she could. Then we get the Retroville 9, which is the robot band episode and the two previous Cheating at Athletics episodes combined. The one unique thing about this one is it's about baseball, and here Jimmy Neutron is showing its age again. In the early 2000s, steroid use in the MLB was a big hot-button issue, so it seems the writers of Jimmy Neutron were commenting on that. Except I was 8 years old, I didn't really know about steroids or its widespread use in the major leagues, and I sort of doubt anyone in the MLB was watching Jimmy Neutron and going, Damn, I gotta get off the sauce. Incidentally, Jimmy has played for the major leagues. There's a lot I could dwell on in this episode. The cliché morals, the lame liar revealed story they have to really stretch to keep going, the weird inconsistencies with Butch having a baseball team, Terry, bizarre costuming issues. Instead, I forgo dwelling on those to instead bring you this quote from the voice of Cobra Bubbles. Somewhere in the Ritridian galaxy, Ultra Lord weeps. That's the only good part of the episode. This is quite possibly the worst one so far. But in the B segment, Jimmy and Co. want a violent video game about killing old ladies. But it's infirmature, so they try to age themselves up, and yeah, it's the end of the baby grandma segment turned into a full episode. But you know what? It works. Carl and Sheen in the B-plot going to a senior's buffet are hilarious, and Jimmy's desperate search for titanium has its humor. I don't think just because the story has an obvious setup means it can't be funny. I love how sketchy everyone in this show secretly is. I suppose, theoretically, a person could accelerate his metabolism to make himself 18, but it would be highly unethical. You mean the only thing standing between us and how multiplayer action is the difference between right and wrong? Although I don't see how that's any less ethical than de-aging your grandmother, or you know, hypnotizing your parents, freezing your rival in a moment in time, or building a fully functional military droid. Oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Up next we got a very special episode of Jimmy Neutron, one of the 44 minute specials in episode 3 of the season. Right before a Halloween special, the introduction of a fan-favorite character, the return of a fan-favorite character, a Christmas episode, and a Valentine's Day episode? They really front-loaded this season with special episodes. And also a lame baseball episode. Operation Rescue Jet Fusion, a take on spy movies, most obviously James Bond. More 60s than 50s, but Jimmy does just kind of reference the nebulous past. This a little more directly answers my questions about the government's take on Jimmy. They want to recruit him. That checks out, actually. They reuse footage in the opening so we get to see both of Libby's hairstyles in the same episode and characters who aren't in this episode. Jimmy and Co. are going to see a movie about a spy named Jet Fusion. Jimmy thinks he'd be cool if he were real. Which like, yeah Jimmy, that's the point of the movie. And his catchphrase is... Got a jet. Shockingly similar to Jimmy's catchphrase. Is it just canon that Jimmy stole his catchphrase from a movie character? Because... That is something a kid would do. Of course, everyone in school is talking about Jet Fusion. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing homework with Jet Fusion. I don't like the way she said that. 
Jimmy is recruited by a big-time secret organization to rescue a missing spy. I wonder who it is. Mom? Dad? I have to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone. Is this about your friend Carl? I really don't like the way he said that. Hey, did you guys know there's a pineapple in the background underwater as a reference to SpongeBob SquarePants? Because Nickelodeon loved to tell us that fact every single commercial break. While retrieving Jet Fusion's tracker, I mean, who could it be's tracker? They run into a fem... As fatal as a kid's show will allow, Beautiful Gorgeous, which is pretty much the perfect child-friendly version of a Bond girl name. But I must say, from the lips of the one who crushed on Cindy Vortex, this show's not very good at sexy. It can do cute, it can do cool, it can do gross, it can do horrifying even, but it's not good at sexy. But boy, they sure did try, didn't they? So I'm pretty sure this is the first episode to confirm that Sheen is Mexican. Must be an aficionado. Actually, I'm Mexican. Anyways, the agent turns out to be Jet Fusion. Whoa, couldn't see that coming. I guess it's like a Malibu Express situation where he's an agent who also plays agents in movies. And my god, this is a star-studded episode. I had no idea how many big names were on Jimmy Neutron. Wendy Malick, Dan Castellaneta, Michael Clark Duncan? Jet Fusion himself is played by fucking Christian Slater. It all started after I graduated from MIT, Caltech, and Harvard. And of course, Tim Curry returns as... Professor Calamitous. Now that's a twist. Honestly, it makes the Jet Fusion twist work. You're focused on that being the obvious reveal, and then they just slide Calamitous in there. Perfect little sleight of hand. Okay, no, I have to address this one specific joke. In a world where evil is spelled E-V-I-L. I remembered this joke, but I couldn't remember what it was from. Whenever I tried to remember, my brain went SpongeBob, and I had to go, no, the joke in SpongeBob is every villain is Lemon. I'm glad I finally figured out what it was, and honestly, I'm glad it was from Jimmy Neutron. This show has stuck with me in ways I didn't even realize. So Calamitous's plan is global warming. Oh, and beautiful gorgeous is his daughter. Oh yeah. Tim Curry as evil Jimmy fucks. I wonder if her mother is some bizarro version of Cindy. Wait, how did he have a kid if he never finishes anything? Which is a habit he claims to have kicked after some self-help classes. Patience. Although he admits to missing the last class, and his plan is missing a few steps. They do a pretty good job with the spy antics. The action is just about good enough for a Jimmy Neutron episode. Honestly, I think the episode is good if you accept its limitations. It's great story-wise, but the visuals are definitely less epic than I think they'd hoped. Then again, from what I've heard, production was so troubled, particularly in the animation department, they were often happy to get anything out. They do have this really cute moment where Jimmy convinces Jet Fusion to do his catchphrase. Oh, okay. Got a jet! But then they do it like three more times. It's too much. They hypnotize Beautiful Gorgeous, fetishy, blow up Calamitous's lab, and Sheen becomes the chosen one for a guild of monks because he can put his leg behind his head. I am only mentioning this because it will be important later. So here's a question. Who the fuck are Jose and Angie? Cause Jimmy's got them on speed dial. Okay, so according to the Jimmy Neutron wiki, this is Angie? Uh, I don't know where they're getting that information, but I, I believe them. I've seen her before. She's, she's one of Jimmy's classmates. Zero results for Jose, though. There are no characters in this show named Jose. And so we come back to where we started. The Halloween episode that prompted the complete rewatch. Carl and Sheen want cool costumes, and Jimmy's dad reminisces about wanting to be Octopus Man. This movie looks awesome. Honestly, I have to wonder if I came hardwired to like B-movies and that's why I liked Jimmy Neutron, or if Jimmy Neutron somehow influenced my current love of B-movies. 
Jimmy offers to give Carl and Sheen the scariest costumes in exchange for 25% of their candy. Something something capitalism. Man, they even made custom Halloween transitions, fuck yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson joke, but at least they didn't call attention to it. Kinda dates the episode. And Jimmy's super secure lab no one can break into? Hugh ends up in there by mistake. And of course, he becomes Frankenstein. I used to love to dress up for Halloween. One year, I was a butterfly. Then I was an elf, a sprite, an ice skater. I was Peter Pan six times. Was Jimmy's principal partial inspiration for Dean Pelton on Community. Discuss. The plot goes exactly where you want it to, with all of them actually becoming the monsters. So Jimmy can just rewrite people's DNA. He could cure cancer, but he doesn't want to. He wants to turn people into dinosaurs. I take it back. This is my favorite Miss Fowl scene. But how do you know about werewolves? I was married to one! But that's a story for another day! And how have I not talked about Sam, the owner of the candy bar, voiced by Billy West? He is always funny. <sighs> I wish I was married. Cindy is dressed as... Goth Cindy. I got nothing. I do like this weird interaction between Cindy and Carl. They don't interact one-on-one -on -one often, but this is a really funny scene to put them in. Carl being seductive at all is kind of funny, but directed at Cindy? Riotous. Sheen goes for Libby, which feels a little obvious, but we do learn a bit more about her. If it keeps Libby on screen, I say we let Sheen have it. Well, don't look at me! I'm a vegetarian! I knew it! Carl owes me two bucks! He thought you were a Republican. See, this is what suburban America is missing nowadays. Random stores that only sell garlic. She must have bitten Libby. We're just good friends. The joke is they fucked. So the monsters fight and team up to rampage through the town. This is better than some of the actual Universal Monster movies. In the end, Jimmy slightly changes the machine so he won't actually become the monster and becomes, you guessed it, Octopus Man. What a perfectly satisfying Halloween episode. Alright, so we've made it back around to the episode that influenced this whole project, and we're actually just shy of halfway through the series. You know, unless you're watching this on Patreon, because my patrons got this segment a little bit early. Uh, so what I thought would be fun to do is to go through all the episodes and tier rank them. Now, I'm doing this now while these are sort of fresh on my mind, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna put the second half of the episodes in once we're done with them. So, this is my tier ranking of the first sort of half of Jimmy Neutron. Um, starting with, of course, the pilot episode, Wind Pants Attack, which has got to go into the A tier. It's just such a solid start to the series. Uh, I, I think it really understands what the series is all about. It really gives you a good idea of what you're getting into with Jimmy Neutron. I'm going to move over, get this shot a little nicer. Yeah, that looks a little better. There we go. Uh, then we got Normal Boy. I guess Normal Boy is also gonna go on the A tier, uh, since I thought it was, like, so insanely funny as a kid. And I, I still think it's pretty funny. I think it's a, a pretty good episode. Birth of a Salesman, unfortunately, is gonna go on the D tier. It's really forgettable. Like, everyone remembers the book gum, but no one remembers the episode the book gum is from. I didn't remember it, and I was, like, a huge Jimmy Neutron fan, so, like... Yeah, that's going in D just for being forgettable. Uh, Brobot. I like Brobot as a character, so uh, sure, we'll go A tier with Brobot too. Uh, the Big Pinch is the one where he brings uh, Thomas Edison back from the past, and that's going in the F tier. It's not a good episode. Um, <laughs> God damn, I'm already filling up the A tier here, but we got Granny Baby, and I, I just, I think Granny is a really funny character. Uh, I think, I think the whole episode, in spite of how, like, obvious the setup is, I think the, the episode really works. It's a fun episode, so that's going to A tier. Time is money, I'm gonna put in C tier. It was nice seeing Jimmy's parents, 
But, like, the, the message, A, it's, like, a super obvious story to do, and B, it just feels so glossed over. It's it's felt like they had this idea for, like, oh, we gotta have an episode where Jimmy meets his parents when they were young so we can do, like, 70s Hugh and Judy. And that was the only idea they had, and then they just made, like, the most cliche possible time travel story. All they wanted to do was do, like, 70s Hugh and 70s Judy. And for that, it gets C tier. Like, I'm not going to put it in the bottom of the list. It is fun to see them like that, but uh, it's not a great episode. Um, Raise the Uzi Scab. Ah, oh, jeez. Is this... <sighs> I gotta put something in B tier, right? I, it's it's a good episode. I enjoy Raise the Uzi Scab. I don't know. It's it's not as good as, like, When Pants Attack or, or Granny Baby, really. But it's a fun episode. We'll go B tier with this one. I Dream of Jimmy, on the other hand, straight to S tier. It's still my favorite episode. It may end up being my favorite episode of the whole series. Uh, Jimmy on Ice, where he creates a second Ice Age, is going in the F tier because it's so thoroughly underwhelming. Like, there's no... There's nothing fun about that episode. It just sort of, like, happens. You're like, uh, okay. Even in my review of it, I said, like, two, three lines. That was the first episode where I just had nothing to say about it. So, yeah, F, F tier, Jimmy on Ice. Uh, Battle of the Bands? Hilarious, uh, A tier, A tier, we're going A tier with it. Now, see Jimmy Run is the one where he, like, bullies some kids, which is weird, but it's also got that really cool goo animation at the end. Uh, so we're going C tier for that one. It's, it's not a great episode, but it's got some solid stuff. Trading Faces, oh god, I think Trading Faces has to go S tier. Like, like... Maybe you could convince me it's an A tier, not an S tier, but like, I don't know, I feel like if you if you were doing like an abridged version of Jimmy Neutron, it's like, what episodes do you need to watch to understand Jimmy Neutron? Trading Faces has got to be one of them, so yeah, S tier, Trading Faces. The Phantom of Retroland, fun episode, not great, we'll put it in B. It's a fun episode though, I enjoy it. My Son the Hamster, I felt, was, like, pretty underwhelming. Not a lot going on in that one. Um, do I want to give it D? I don't even... D feels a little low, because it is... There, there's, there's, like, some charm to it, but it's it's not a great episode. We'll go, we'll go see with that one. Time is money, see Jimmy run my son. Yeah, yeah, that feels like a good place for it. Uh, Hall Monster, I'm gonna go B tier with Hall Monster. It is pretty similar to that Spongebob episode, but it feels a lot more anti-police, <laughs> weirdly enough. Uh, Hypno Birthday to You, that's a B tier. That's also a B tier. Solid episode, but, like, not the greatest. Crunch Time has got, like, the super good candy, so that's gotta go in the A tier. Uh, substitute creature, Miss Fowl becomes a giant monster. Mm. Oh, and there is that really funny B plot where Q is getting a new toast. All right, we're g it's getting an A just for the toaster jokes. Uh, safety first is going in S tier. It's the introduction of the nanobots, and I think the nanobots are hilarious. Uh, Crime Sheen Investigation, on the other hand, is going in D tier, and that hurts me a little, because that is the episode that, like, I... It's probably the episode I watched the most as a kid, just because I had it for video now, but it's like... I don't know, it's not a, it's not a good episode, honestly. Like, it's, it's not that funny. Uh, Journey to the Center of Carl, solid episode. Um... Okay, I, I'm giving it A tier just because of that really good Miss Fowl scene. Og Wilderness, thoroughly underwhelming. That's going in the D tier. Party at Neutrons. Could have been A tier, except it introduces Betty Quinlan, so I'm knocking it down to B tier. Um, Ultra Sheen. Ultra Sheen is A tier. 
Uh, any Ultra Lord focused episode has, has got to get some extra points. And and a Sheen focused episode too, so <laughs> shout out to Sheen. Now I think with a little bit of effort it could have been an S tier episode. Um, it, it, it does fall just a little short, but I think it's really good. So A tier with that one. Broadcast Blues goes in pretty obvious directions, but I do think Funky Jam Dance Party with some science is a solid joke. It's, it's a decent episode. We'll, we'll go B tier with it. Professor Calamitous, I presume, has to go straight to A tier, uh, S tier, excuse me, S tier. Much like the Nanobots, just a villain I love. Uh, Maximum Hue. In spite of my criticisms of it, I am giving it at least D tier. Because it has some solid jokes. I like the ending where it turns out everyone has cheated at this. But like, I don't know, it's kind of... Honestly, I, does it deserve C tier? Uh, here's the thing. If if C Jimmy Run and Make Room for daddy didn't exist, this could be C tier. Maybe even B tier. Uh, but... Nah, I think I gotta go D tier with it. Sleepless in Retroville is the sleepover episode. <sighs> is the sleepover episode S tier. For the ending alone, for the ending alone, Sleepless in Retroville gets S tier. Um, the Eggpire Strikes Back, honestly... I'm going B tier with it. Because, like, it's supposed to be this grand follow-up to the movie. And it's just kind of okay. Like, it's an okay episode. And clearly they wanted it to be more than an okay episode. Uh, make Room for daddy -O, solid C tier. Like, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's a C tier episode. A Beautiful Mind S tier. I love that one. Solid, solid episode. Sorry, wrong era. <sighs> is that A tier or is it S tier? That, I mean, S tier is already getting kind of crowded, but, uh... <sighs> I, I'm gonna go A tier. I just, I'm going A tier. Just because of, like, the weird, weird ending where, like, Jimmy's mom has a cage for his dad... That weirds me out so much, I'm putting it in A tier. Beach Party Mummy, S tier. Not even a question. That is an S tier episode. Uh, if It might not be the only Libby-centric episode. I'd have to think. I don't think there's another Libby-centric episode. If there is, it's definitely not as good as Beach Party Mummy. That is the best Libby-centric episode. The Retroville 9, F tier. Not a good episode. Uh, Grumpy Young Men, solid. B tier. We'll give that one B tier. Operation Rescue Jet Fusion. Uh, much like the Eggpire Strikes Back, clearly they intended for it to be, like, a, a big thing, and I don't think it was as grand as they maybe wanted it to be, but I like it better than the Eggpire Strikes Back, at least in part because it has Professor Calamitous, so I'm going A tier with Jet Fusion, honestly. Uh, Nightmare in Retroville, the one we just watched, the Halloween episode, solid S tier. It is a perfect Halloween episode. Alright, and that's all the episodes I've discussed so far tier ranked. Lot in the A tier! Um, I guess y you can kind of tell, like, I'm a little biased, I like this show, I'm putting a lot of the episodes in the top half of the list. Now, maybe when we get to, like, later in the third season, we'll fill up more of the bottom of this list, but I can't even say that for sure. I don't remember how good or bad the third season was. I remember it gets weird near the end, but I think we could easily end up with a tier chart where most of the episodes are in the top half. And Because, I mean, even right now, like... The top three tiers vastly outnumber the bottom three tiers. There might even... Hold on. Nine, ten... <laughs> okay, there are as many A-tier episodes as there are C, D, and F-tier. So, I mean, that's a good sign for the show, but also kind of indicates that I am biased and I like most of these episodes. <laughs> um... 
But, you know, I do at least have episodes I don't think are as good, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this layout. I'm happy with this tier chart. You know, sometimes in the right light, Miss Fowl looks kinda... So apparently since last episode, Miss Fowl and Sam have begun dating. I'd say good for them, but we all know Miss Fowl's not prepared to commit. In this episode, we get to see the mayor's face, and it's Clark Gable? There's a lake monster, and Jimmy's out to prove it doesn't exist by doing a whole Jaws parody that's just a little too obvious. Still, I like the salty sea dog, Captain Betty, and the weird way Sheen grows attached to him. Oh, nicely done, laddie buck. I like the cut of your jib. That is why I made you this. Wow, a genuine scrimshot pea shooter. I love you, Captain Betty. If I had a nickel for every Jimmy Neutron character named Betty that I actually liked, I'd have one nickel. Carl says he lost a turtle here as a kid, so naturally the monster turns out to be his pet turtle. Mutated by years of Hugh dumping nuclear runoff from Jimmy's lab? <laughs> now a Jaws reference, that's lame. Everyone does Jaws references. You know what's cool? A Gamera reference. Gamera is really neat. Gamera is filled with meat. We've been eating Gamera. This one's a little mixed, but it gets points for having Captain Betty just get eaten. He lives, but still, holy shit. And this next episode is a milestone for the series. It's the debut of iconic character Bolby Stroganovsky, an exchange student from the fictional country of Bakharistan. Slap, 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 clap, 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 slap, 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 clap, 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 slap, slap, slap. So, uh, back in the day, there was this... Hot Wheels VCR camera, and uh, I had one, and I would just fill tapes with all sorts of random sketches. Uh, luckily, I've had the foresight not to save those tapes, but one of my favorite skits to do was one called Bulby Time, in which I impersonated Bulby Stroganovsky and talked about a variety of topics. I found the dumbest shit from this show hilarious. Is this character racist? In order to answer that question, you'd first have to tell me what nationality he's a parody of, cause to me he's so... all of Europe that it kinda works. I mean, I guess it could be taken as a stereotype of just being foreign, but I'm American. I don't give a fuck what Europeans think. I also don't give a fuck what Americans think. Fuck y'all too. It's class president elections. Kids, do not let our school system fool you. There is absolutely nothing special about being class president. Especially in elementary school, where it basically just means you get to stay after school and have a cookie. College is the only place where any sort of student leadership matters. Your power in elementary school is basically non-existent, even when democratically elected by your peers. I can't run because of that silly little incident last year. You mean when you were stuffing the ballot boxes with your name? That was never proven! Man, all of our childhood heroes were corrupt. Sheen is blackmailing Carl, and Jimmy's attempt to win involves making everyone sticky, throwing candy on the ground, and, um... Sexy ladies? Where did Jimmy get sexy ladies? Did he invent the sexy ladies? Does he have some Rocky Horror-esque invention that creates sexy people? In the end, it comes down to Carl's vote, but he exposes Jimmy and Co.'s unethical practices, so Bowlby is now president. Slap, 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 clap, 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 slap, 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 clap, 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 everybody, slap, slap, slap. 10 out of 10 episode, I'm sorry. If you're not here for weird Jimmy Neutron, what are you here for? What are any of us here for? And why aren't the nanobots here? Let's bring back the nanobots. In this episode, Jimmy and Cindy are writing poetry about each other, so Jimmy asks his gay friends for help. That is the only way I can interpret what is going on here. This prompts them to escape to their old ship. Could they have done this the whole time? I guess Jimmy switched their heads, maybe they weren't smart enough before? Yeah, okay, but the nanobots will never be ballin'. This time, the nanobots get to kill people, and they finally make this show perfect. It's just you. Uh, Weezer? Weezer? Uh, Weezer? 
Where is everybody? And I think they played the long game with this pie joke. Hugh loves pie. When he thinks he's the last man on Earth, he finds endless pie. Jimmy makes the nanobots calculate pie, which is infinite. You see what I mean? You might accidentally learn something from this show. And somehow the nano ship exploding undeletes everyone. This is my favorite episode of the entire series. The nanobots are hilarious, and this is perhaps Hugh's greatest story. Now look, I know what you're all thinking. Matt, shouldn't you be working on a Christmas video? Fool! This is the Christmas video! <laughs> you know what, surprisingly? Fruitcake Mountain Dew? A lot better than gingerbread Mountain Dew. Still, Mountain Dew, please, come on. It's Christmas in Retroville, and Jimmy is concerned about... This very nebulous and highly speculative issue of Santa Claus. They sing a surprisingly decent Christmas song. Definitely sounds better than Funky Jam Dance Party. Basking in the warm of Christmas Day! Now this show was animated right here in the great state of Texas. And apparently it takes place there too because it's Christmas and there's no snow on the ground. Cindy and Libby sing about the glory of consumerism, and Jimmy's a little Ben Shapiro about it. These feelings that you speak of are subjective. All I want is something that is real. But it turns out Jimmy's reasons for not believing in Santa are equally subjective, as he asked for a sample from a dwarf star that he didn't get. But like, come on, he was obviously naughty that year. You think a kid who erased an entire year of his parents' marriage is on the nice list? And as proof, Jimmy's DNA sequencing device detects Santa's DNA, so they're off to the North Pole to look for him. Cindy and Libby get trapped in Jimmy's hypercube, which seems like a really forced way to get them in on the adventure. But then Jimmy just sends them back to Retroville. What was the point? Complete waste of Cindy and Libby. They get to Santa's workshop and Jimmy's machine kills Santa. But Jimmy, still a non-believer, says if he can deliver all the toys, it'll prove Santa doesn't exist. Jimmy, wouldn't that prove Santa could exist? Like, if you couldn't do it, that would be evidence Santa couldn't do it. But if you can do it, what's stopping Santa from just doing what you did? He even retrofits his rocket to be Jingle Bell powered for no apparent reason. Meanwhile, Hugh invents... Christmas but with pie? Christmas already has pie. There's a whole song about this and I'm still really unclear what the holiday is. He breaks into people's houses and gives them pie? Meanwhile, world's dumbest genius has forgotten to deliver any presents to Retroville. Like his hometown is the only place on earth he forgot to deliver presents. Luckily, Santa arrives to save them, and this has to be one of the best Santa castings ever. So you're Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> You've been on my naughty list for some time now. It's Mel Brooks, one of the most famously Jewish comedians, and also one of the funniest people to ever live. He even gets to do a brain blast. Brain blast! Apparently Jimmy never got his samples because it needed five years to cool? So Santa can get a sample from a dwarf star, but he still has to wait for it to cool. Yeah, okay, why not? Hey, you wanna know what I got for Christmas? It's Goddard! No, seriously, I'm pretty sure I got this for Christmas. I love Goddard so much. Jimmy's one successful invention, proving to be whatever Jimmy needs him to be. I think Goddard is the first thing that worked about this show. You look at that Johnny Quasar clip, and that kid's a long way from Jimmy. But that guy? That's Goddard. He has such a good design. He's clearly both robot and dog. He's just adorable. I think he's supposed to be remote controlled. He's got like an antenna here. But I'm pretty sure I lost the remote to this a long, long time ago. But he does have a little button on the side so he can still... He's gonna knock over all my shit. That doesn't sound like Frank Welker's barking, actually. He opens up in the top, but there's not really, like... It's, it's just like a switch panel, like, uh, where, where you put batteries and shit. But, you know, it's cool that he opens up like that, like, you know, the real Goddard does. 
Look at him. Look at the little car. Oh. He can even like stick his tongue up in there and get him to close his mouth. Ah. Unlike the Halloween special, I'd say the Christmas one's a mixed bag. Definitely some good humor, and obviously I love Mel Brooks as Santa, but honestly it feels like maybe they were stretching to make this a full 22 minutes. I guess it'd be weird to only do an 11 minute Christmas segment. Not stretching, however, is the all-important Valentine's Day special. Which makes it okay that this video definitely didn't come out before Christmas. And this one's way more important to the series overall. We learned that these two characters are dating. You remember these two, right? This one and, uh, that one? Jimmy invents a love potion, Carl breaks his computer, and now Jimmy and Sheen have a crush on Cindy and Libby respectively. You know, like they didn't already. This is, however, the episode to introduce Carl having a crush on Jimmy's mom. And I know what you're waiting for me to address. Why is Jimmy allowed to drive a hover car? Like, he drives it like you drive a car. He even abides by road safety laws. He's 10 years old. Does he have a license for that? In Fairly Odd Parents, they made Timmy get a license for his hover car. Sheen is a freak, but I guess it works? This one has a musical number too, and uh... Jesus Christ, every cartoon was written by perverts. But they make great cartoons, those perverts. There's a, uh, a Hugh Hefner joke? Access holographic room imaging. File name, Hef. What? I kinda like how insane all of the characters are in this episode, though. And bonus points for Hugh asking his adult wife to be his valentine. That's sweet. I like that they kinda reset the status quo, but not really. The romance only becomes more pronounced from here. So yeah, not as funny as the Christmas episode, but story-wise, I think they got this one down way better. The song is definitely worse, though. Up next is Sheen's Brain, one of the show's more memorable, not entirely for good reason. Although it's a close examination of the character Sheen and his particular flavor of neurodivergency. What kind of name is Ida? What's it short for? Ida preferred a different name? Sheen, concentrate! I am concentrating. Hey look, TV. <laughs> With a big test coming up, Sheen is hit with the threat of being held back, something his friends won't stand for. No way! We're the Three Amigops! The Three Amigops? Yeah, well, you see, I was making us name tags, and I accidentally added a P. Jimmy uses the brain drain helmet to make Sheen smart, and he quickly becomes evil. So yeah, Sheen is the character I relate to most. Glad we got that established. Also, his head keeps growing in this episode until it looks like this. You know the subtitles on Paramount Plus get something wrong? Uh, Jimmy likes to say leapin' leptons. Now, a lepton is a subatomic particle, anything smaller than a proton or neutron. I believe electrons are actually classified as a lepton. Except the dummies at Paramount Plus have decided what Jimmy is saying is leapin' electrons. I don't know, I've always liked how freaky this episode gets. Although the conclusion with this Ultra Lord costume is bullshit. This is not one of Jimmy's reality-bending inventions. This was on sale in a costume shop. Of course, what gets him to return to normal is thinking he's hurt Jimmy and Carl because you can't split up the three Amigops. Overall, I think it's a solid episode. We didn't get too many episodes solely focused on Sheen, so it's nice to see it done well. They even keep Miss Fowl's love life consistent. I'm afraid of commitment! And they finally give Butch a funny line. And what if we all went around freakishly enlarging our friends' heads, huh? Ooh, me first! Me first! Still doesn't bully anyone, though. Ah, yes, Sheen Estevez. His name a reference to the Estevez family of actors, many of whom have taken up the stage name Sheen. Uh, Sheen is the comedic heart of the show. He is absolutely the funniest character. Honestly, I think Sheen is what kept me invested in the show as a kid. Of course, I loved Jimmy and his wacky adventures and all the other characters too. But I was a kid who loved comedy and Sheen was always the funniest. Sure, what he brings to the table is a little more obvious than the others, but he's an important piece of the puzzle nonetheless. And man, here's another character-centric episode, this time focusing on Jimmy's mom, Judy Neutron. 
It's a pretty standard not appreciating mom enough setup, which is not only a very common TV trope, it's one that honestly usually feels a little off. Like, Jimmy and Hugh appreciate Judy, they can cause issues for her, but they usually have their comeuppance and make amends. Hell, Jimmy learning to appreciate his parents was the entire point of the movie. But here they're assholes, so Judy goes to a week at a spa, leaving them a long list of chores. Naturally, Jimmy programs a robot that goes crazy and imprisons he and his dad inside, and Mom has to save them with the laser gun she keeps in her closet? Okay, that's not usually part of the trope. Aunt Susie makes a return appearance. Certainly laughs to be had with this episode, but it plays a little too much into well-worn jokes. Switching to wife mode. Take out the trash! We never talk anymore. Give me some ice cream. I have far less to say about Judy than I did with Hugh. I still think she's a great character. I appreciate that she can be tough, but still comes off as a loving, caring mother. It's honestly a little odd how full circle Jimmy's family feels. Like, TV families used to be all kind and loving, and then The Simpsons mixed it up by making them flawed and dysfunctional. And everyone started doing that. Even Jimmy's sister show Fairly Odd Parents as outright neglectful parents, although that's actually part of the story, it's why he gets fairies. The Neutrons have a very different relationship than most TV families. Hugh is dumb, but not oblivious the way a lot of cartoon parents are, which is often used as a way to get them out of the picture while the central children go on adventures. Meanwhile, Judy is the firm hand of punishment, but never in a way that makes her seem mean or unreasonable. Hell, Jimmy probably causes more problems for himself than she does. Next episode, Jimmy is trying to get out of a list of chores his mother has for him, and didn't we literally just do this? Like, I'm okay with that being a setup multiple times, hell, it was kind of the plot of the pilot. But break it up a little, these are halves of the same 30 minute block. Luckily, this one's the classic clones episode. It seems the six clones are split half and half between Rob Paulson and Jeff Bennett. I know Bennett's definitely cool, Jimmy, because it's the exact same voice he does for Barbarino. I'm walking here, you got a problem with that skateboard boy? Hey, cool, voices in my head. They even do another John Travolta joke, this time Saturday Night Fever. And I love that he pulls a helmet out of nowhere to skateboard because Nick obviously wouldn't let him skateboard without it. Uh, the network Nick, not this Nick. This Nick probably would let him do it without a helmet. Although, he can't even handle the Neutron style. Happy Jimmy, Sad Jimmy, and Funny Jimmy sure are there. Romantic Jimmy knows what lies in Jimmy's heart, and Evil Jimmy has a dead-on Jack Nicholson impression for a voice. Not that he sounds exactly like Jack Nicholson, but because he sounds like every Jack Nicholson impression you've ever heard. Well, 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 if it isn't Jimmy, 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 Goddard, and Jimmy. Oh, you know what, it's that evil one. He's so bad he makes a tell of the hunt look like Bambi! My man, he threw a pie in a guy's face, that's it. <laughs> you can't beat the classics. It's also clear this episode was made just for the jokes because it's hilarious, but also they didn't know how to end the episode. Evil Jimmy runs behind a corner and changes his hair, and the clones of our boy genius get confused. So then Jimmy freezes them, but the evil one gets away, and when everyone finds out Jimmy let one escape, they chase normal Jimmy instead of the evil clone? And this time it's not like a trick, they actually want to, like, beat the shit out of Jimmy rather than deal with the clone on the loose. But hey, it was a good episode that introduced a cool, if not a bit obvious, villain. The next episode is bizarre. It's a heist episode? Why is Jimmy Neutron doing a heist episode? Like, sure, it'd be a cool thing to do with his inventions, but he doesn't even use any, instead relying on a power Libby has never had before and Cindy's karate, which is consistent with canon. Like, this is going exactly where you think it's going, and it's kind of weird how dedicated they are to not subverting your expectations at all. They do not even try to hide that the woman who contacted Jimmy is evil, or that Carl left the real egg so she only gets away with the fake one. I forgot this episode existed, but now that I'm re-watching it, I remember being 
bored by this one as a kid. It's not really funny, it doesn't have a very good story, they even have the evil princess turn out to be Professor Calamitous, which is such a lame way to bring back an iconic villain. It adds nothing to the episode. Well, okay, it adds this line. When I rule the Earth, you shall receive a charming gift basket. But that's it. It feels like a deleted plotline from Jet Fusion that should have stayed deleted. I don't think it's as lame as the baseball episode, but it's still the worst episode of the season so far. So an appropriate place for a Betty Quinlan reference. Then Jimmy's dad and Carl's dad get in a feud and refuse to let them see each other. So both the A segment and the B segment are gonna be lame. But at least in both of them, Sheen is funny. He's already selected a rap theme greeting for an additional three cents a word. Ahem. Uh, uh. Dear Jimmy, how are you? What's up? What's new? But you can't just put Jimmy and Carl in silly outfits and expect that to make this a good episode. I, I mean, it makes it a little better. It's also another episode that ends with characters wanting to beat up a child for no apparent reason. And man, this season was on a hot streak, but after that double bill of disappointment, we get Out Darn Spotlight, which features the return of Betty Quinlan. But also the return of Bulby? Alright, but you're on thin ice. Honestly, Betty works a little better in this one, but they really do lean into her liking Jimmy. But I know they're not gonna get together, so you're just setting us up for disappointment. That's the problem I've always had with Betty. It seems like the show wants me to want them to get together. But I don't want Jimmy and Betty to get together. I want Jimmy and Cindy to get together. Who the fuck is Betty Quinlan? I bet even people who watch this show don't remember her. To go back to the Trixie comparison, Fairly Odd Parents was a bit more mean-spirited than Jimmy Neutron, so they got away with Trixie being mean to Timmy. And to make another comparison within the show, it's outright stated a few times that Cindy is interested in Nick, but the show never pretends this is an option. Nick never really gives Cindy the time of day, which I think is how Betty should treat Jimmy. Betty is too nice to Jimmy. I know there won't be any good payoff. And it even starts to feel like she's talking down to him at points, like, Come on, Jimmy, you can do it. That being said, this episode is good enough I'm willing to take back something I said last season. This should have been Betty's last appearance. It also probably should have been her first appearance. Betty's not the only downside. Cindy trying to get famous feels both out of character and extremely obvious. And there's a crack at Keanu Reeves in there. And downloaded the Keanu Reeves advanced acting course. Whoa, is this a laser sword I see before me? I'm telling you kids, I was the only one defending Keanu Reeves back in the day. But Principal Willoughby seriously just being Dean Pelton and actually getting to see Macbeth in space, it's like half the episode, make this one great. And when I say the animation hasn't aged well, I'm talking about the models, textures, and lighting. The actual character rigging is honestly really good. You get awkward glitches in there, but again, this show was made in a rush it seems, and I think they put their focus exactly where it needed to be. And speaking of Nick, he's also had a character redesign this season, going from a blue shirt to a leather jacket, and you know what? I never noticed as a kid. It wasn't anywhere near as noticeable as Cindy or Libby. In fact, I had to see it twice in this watch through as an adult to catch on. I thought he was just wearing a leather jacket to skateboard last episode. It wasn't until I noticed he was wearing it again in this one that I realized this was his new look. Also, I love that they mentioned Sheen's laser spear has a real laser in it, and that just doesn't come back. Why would you need a real laser for a school play? I thought it was a Chekhov's laser or something, but no, he uses a normal old jetpack in the climax. He had one of those in the movie. This laser was introduced for no reason. Overall, I'd say it's a well-written episode that seems to be written by someone who doesn't quite understand the show, which is a weird thing to say because it was written by the head writer. Perhaps there was studio interference at play, but that would just be speculation on my part. I liked it, though. Next is another return, this time of Brobot, who tells Jimmy about an impending Mooney Man attack, and they finally answer the question we all have. How come whenever we're in outer space, we don't gotta wear helmets? Good question, Sheen. 
And the answer is quite interesting. You see... Moon, 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 spoon, 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 June, 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 spoon, 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 spoon. Anyways, turns out Brobot just pranked them so they can play together. After a very on-the-nose Boy Who Cried Wolf reference, Brobot guilts Jimmy into staying until Brobot tells a new story about the Junk Man, prompting Jimmy to leave. The Junk Man? That sounds like a villain on a lame TV show that people watch because they have no real lives. Thanks, Jimmy. I also figured that space was just a flat image behind them, but the shot where it doesn't even go all the way to the edge of the screen basically confirms that. Naturally, they get caught by the junk man, and Goddard has a crush on this cool space dog. Oh, baby. A romance for the ages. They gotta save Brobot's parents, who didn't really do anything in their first appearance, so it's fun to see them expanded upon. Hey, Captain, where's the poop deck? Can we ride on the poop deck? I just love the word poop deck. I know what you mean. <laughs> Can't say poop without saying deck. Robot shows up and helps Jimmy and his friends escape, but ultimately the junk man gets away because at this point they were really committed to bringing back villains. I guess Calamitous escapes in season one, but that's about it. Not the greatest, but a fun episode. Definitely some memorable jokes. Hey, you guys want to see a Betty Quinlan episode done right? Next episode, they're on a school field trip to the rodeo, so yeah, they definitely live in Texas. And this is the most deranged Miss Fowl has ever been. I love it. The five O's on our tail, that is a good example. Hang on, children! But here's the part I'm talking about. Sagebrush Sally. A cowgirl the three Amigops instantly have a crush on. And Sagebrush Ali gets everything right that Betty Quinlan gets wrong. This episode really helped me pin down why I don't like Betty. The show acts like she's status quo, but she is not. She's not a member of the gang. She's not Nick or Libby or Miss Fowl or Hugh. She was in one episode of season one. She's less important than Robo Fiend. Sage, meanwhile, is decidedly a new character. I feel properly introduced to her. And I know she and Jimmy are not hooking up at the end of the episode. And if we ever see her again, it'll be a deliberate callback to this episode. And they play the guys striking out with her as a joke. They're being dumb and they get a comeuppance. Jimmy striking out with Betty isn't played for laughs. It just makes me feel bad for Jimmy. Also, they use her to make Cindy jealous instead of, like, fame obsessed. I'm sorry you gotta suffer like this, babe, but you're way funnier when you're jealous. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm dwelling on this, but it really bothered me as a kid. I'm just trying to unpack it. Anyways, this episode finally gives Jimmy an appropriately sized hat. He needs all ten gallons! Woohoo! Also, they're trying to do this, oh, the boys are faking to impress a girl, but Sheen actually pulls off some impressive stuff. Carl takes on the future Back at the Barnyard star, and Jimmy's fake bull just blatantly has switches and control panels. Jimmy, surely you could just get a magnetic saddle or something. Sweet Buster's the child of trouble! God damn it, just when I thought I'd seen Miss Fowl's best episode. Next episode features an idea I also had as a kid before I knew how fuel and the oil lobby worked. Using garbage to power cars. See, I told you garbage could be most into a clean burning oil substitute. No, you didn't. Oh. Maybe I dreamed it. Cindy makes a case that Jimmy should be banned from the school science fair, which is bullshit, but it works. Ooh, a trial! I've always wanted to be a judge, and the robes! Don't get me started, okay? And holy hell, I knew Cindy was a lesser genius, but I think Libby might be too. A mood CD player. It detects your mood by measuring skin temperature, then chooses a CD match it. Ooh, let me try! You're my candy girl! Barred from the science fair, Jimmy wins a Junior Nobel Prize, which they definitely send one single guy to award to you at your elementary school, unannounced. Also, he invented a way to turn trash into oil. I think that should qualify for an actual Nobel Prize. Or at the very least, like, a billion in hush money from the oil companies. Of course it goes haywire, and the other students need to use their inventions to stop it. I can't believe it's not oil. 
I can't believe you're not in jail! The machine has a slight malfunction. This is still borderline alchemy. Honestly, just use a conveyor belt. The trash-seeking hose was a bad idea in the first place. Of course, it goes haywire because of Bowlby's experiment. All right, new theory. Bowlby is a CIA operative, and this was their way of getting Jimmy's invention out of the picture. Hey, kid, forget about that. I got four words for you. Big McThankies from McSpankies. Jimmy invents flying helmets that run on gold, and I guess he didn't know that fuel burns? Also, two episodes ago, he built flying shoes that did this exact same thing, no problem. How are the helmets better? They agree they have to get jobs to replace the gold, even though Jimmy can create diamonds, pearls, and oil. And apparently there's a nuclear plant in Jimmy's town? Which is consistent with the Jimmy Neutron game for PC. Don't ask me how I know that. They end up at a burger joint, Mick Spanky's, with the lovely and infamous Skeet. Dude, you're supposed to push the buttons with the pictures of food on them? Don't need to, Skeet. I memorized the prices and did the tax and change in my head. Jimmy, you dipshit. You press the buttons so they know you're not swiping from the till. Actually, I love this episode because Skeet totally calls Jimmy on being a dipshit. Yeah, if you asked people to start naming episodes of Jimmy Neutron, this would probably be the most common response. I know I quoted Hugh's Taco Shack song endlessly as a kid. And it gave us the great meme, uh, uh, steamed hams or something. You know, these hamburgers are quite similar to the ones they have at Krusty Burger. <laughs> oh, no. Patented Skinner Burgers. Jimmy brings the restaurant into the future. While your fries are boiled in the finest imported oils at precisely 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Jimmy, that sounds kind of expensive. How are you bankrolling this? And Jimmy's design can't account for one customer wanting to go somewhere else without going completely haywire. And apparently he equipped it with the ability to fly and brought back the purple flurp gun, but firing whatever the Nickelodeon splat was made of. That stuff's bad for you. Jimmy sends McSpankies into the sun, where it's commandeered by the Space Bandits from the Mine episode. Which means I must now go full geek mode and correct something I said last time. I told you all this guy was named Zia and this guy was named Barbarino. That's what IMDB credits them as. But Wikipedia and the Jimmy Neutron wiki have their names listed as Zix and Travoltron. So I went to the source with this one and according to the end credits, this guy is Zix and this guy is Barbarino. So they each got one right and one wrong. Until season three rolls around and they call him Travoltron. Not confusing at all. I guess that makes Travoltron his official name, since they don't actually call him Barbarino in the show. T is still just T, though. You know, I acted surprised that Jimmy's parents partook in marijuana last time, but this next episode straight up confirms it. Yeah, well, that's what burning duck is all about, Weezer, my man. We're gonna let it all hang out. Groove to a natural scene. Maybe even toast some marshmallows. Honey, put your pants on. You can groove when we get to the desert. Jimmy stays with the Weezers, who have every sort of ailment, so Jimmy gives them pills that make them more athletic. Oh, can you make people more athletic, Jimmy? I, I didn't know that. You've never done that type of thing before. I'm bitching for no reason again. This is the best version of that plot. Because of course this time the pill could wear off at any moment. And I can't even say that's inconsistency. Jimmy makes it very clear he only wants this for the weekend. I always loved the joke of them holding in the air until the moment the pills wear off. And in the end, their powerful sneezes save the day. Solid episode, nothing grand, but you need those in a series. Next, Jimmy faces off against a douchey rich kid he beat in a kite contest, Eustace Stretch. And it's fun to see Jimmy jealous of someone hitting on Cindy. Cindy is always the jealous bitch, so it's nice to see Jimmy have his moment. And the rich kid is holding robot animal fights. This is a very Nickelodeon way to have dog fights in your basement. Like, 
everyone just suddenly gets super uncomfortable when this happens, as if it was a real dog fight. I'm positive one of the Five Nights at Freddy's games has ripped off this robot cat of Eustace's. Another decent one, it's cool to see Jimmy up against someone with equivalent technology, and I love Hugh and Mr. Starch getting along, even if it is only one scene. And so at last, we've come to the season finale, and before we get into it, let me just ask you, from your memory, what is the longest episode of Jimmy Neutron? Not counting the movie, obviously, just the TV show. I, I just want you to think about it in your head, maybe write it down somewhere. You know, longest episode, was it the fusions, the twonkies, the power hours? No, in fact, the longest episode of Jimmy Neutron is Win, Loser, Kaboom. It guest starred Tim Allen and Alyssa Milano. How did I forget this episode existed? Completely honestly here, I forgot this episode existed for years. And as soon as I read the title, I went, Oh, fuck, I do remember this. I was so hyped for this episode when I was a kid. A Jimmy Neutron TV movie? Something to rival Channel Chasers, or perhaps more importantly, the TV movies Cartoon Network shows were getting? But this shit was buried. This memory has laid dormant in my brain for probably over a decade. Which is weird to say about a feature-length season finale. If there's one episode you should remember, it should be the hour-long season finale, right? We start not with the theme song, but with giant asteroids with cryptic text. They land on a planet of worms who say MIP, and a planet of all my D&D characters. Cindy is quite literally trying to negotiate the terms of a proposed friendship between she and Jimmy, and Sheen gets into pickup culture. It's a phase, he'll outgrow it. The space rock is important enough to bring back Mayor Gable, and they turn the rock into a tourist attraction because Cindy is kinda racist against aliens. Haven't we learned from the Yokians not to talk to intergalactic strangers? Oh, but this is big enough for the general from the movie to return. And then they do a heist in Jimmy Neutron that is good, very stylish, even if it does remind me of Ang Lee's Hulk. It's short and simple, and it feels like every character contributes. How often is this show going to do something wrong only to turn around and prove they knew how to do it right the whole time? Also, I swear when I made that joke about Boldy being in the CIA, I didn't remember this. Hello, fellow children! Boldy! I now fully believe Boldy is an undercover agent sent to spy on Jimmy. Anyways, by filling in the correct answer, Jimmy enters Earth in a game show. Jimmy claims the rock could only be solved by advanced species, but the warmongering orcs made it. They filled the stands with every single alien they've had on the show, and also apparently germs and the lima bean from Carl's Nightmare are aliens. Your planet is being connected to the Galactic Cable Network, with over 9 billion channels of service. <gasps> Free cable?! From space? Look at all these great shows. Laser Soccer from Regulon. Who wants to marry a Yokian? Stunt! Matt. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. You, you, you stay over there. You stay where you are. They play Quidditch. Like, you can't tell me this isn't just space Quidditch. Jimmy's a little too cocky, and it loses them the game. Hey, this episode is bringing back every character I said only appeared once, because there's Libby and Cindy's dads, along with the Weezers and Sheen's dad getting his first line since the movie. I will run powerful extension cords to your lawn. Yes. Anyways, after basically stealing from Harry Potter and Monty Python, they do a Survivor parody, and Bulby's punishment for getting voted off is... To the Cindy and Alyssa Milano orc get in a cat fight, and apparently using Goddard in the final match is cheating, but not when he did it earlier. While racing brain people, they think they win and get sent home, and this scene was definitely buried in the recesses of my mind. Here kids, eat and forget this whole scary business. Yes, eat children, eat and forget. Creepy, but also really cool. And of course, Jimmy learns they work better when they work together. And they do a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire parody just to prove it really was the early 2000s. And after feeling unappreciated, Jimmy lets Hugh answer the final question to save the Earth. And they really all just go, fuck those other planets. 
But Jimmy says that's not right and they go back to save them. And they all learn to work together because of course they do. They also learned that torture is acceptable. <laughs> And what are we in the season on but Jimmy and Cindy almost kissing. Win, lose, and kaboom I think is the purest essence of Jimmy Neutron. Some good stuff, some dumb stuff, some stuff that's amazing it ever happened. It has everything. This is what Jimmy Neutron was. And though the memories are easily buried, once dug up they all come flooding back. I'm glad Win, Lose, and Kaboom is the longest episode of Jimmy Neutron. I'm also glad it's kind of forgotten, if only because I think it says something about the show. And that's season two of The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron, and holy shit, this season was stacked. It has clunkers just like season one, but a lot of the show's best and most iconic episodes come from right here. It honestly makes me worried for season three. What's even left? I remember like three episodes. But that's a very good sign for season two. This is when the show excelled. I think any TV show that was ever this good deserves credit. I was prepared to call this revisit a success after season one. This show was good. But season two proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I hope maybe I've brought back some nostalgic memories from you or clued you into something you knew very little about before. It's truly been awesome coming back to a childhood obsession and finding that so much of it is still thoroughly entertaining. So I ended season one by talking about a piece of Jimmy Neutron spinoff media, that being the movie. And I'm gonna end season three by talking about another piece of Jimmy Neutron spinoff media. So I thought it was only fitting that season two end with a discussion of the video games. Yeah, it turns out uh, that video game video is gonna be over an hour long. It would be like at least half this video and it just seemed kind of weird to dedicate half this video to a completely different subject. I was even planning on uploading that video like separately somewhere so you could watch only the video game portion, but now it honestly makes a little more sense to just make the video game portion its own video. So there will actually be five videos in the Jimmy Neutron series. And the next one is all about the video games. Uh, so I'll see you in that one, I guess.